something to say. Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Project Shadow, my name is Charlie, you might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, and yeah, I'm sure you can hear my cold is in full effect, but today it leveled up and I now have a massive sinus headache to go along with the sneezing and everything else, so yay! But I promised that I would be doing these episodes... And so we're powering through. I hope my voice isn't too distracting for you all. So yeah, if you clicked on this episode because of the rather melodramatic title, I kind of made it. We got the first trailer for the new Hellboy reboot. And I could sum it up really, really simply. This is not Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy. That That's kind of all that it said yeah no we're not doing another Guillermo del Toro movie this is different we're different look sunshine 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 really plasticky costumes and sunshine really bad special effects and sunshine hopefully these effect shots are not entirely finished and they will be cleaned up by the time the actual movie comes out because that was upsetting I've seen that a lot in trailers lately, where the effects really don't look finished. And this one, they really didn't look finished to me. Now, I, I find it almost fortuitous that I did the episode that I did yesterday on Venom and the future of film. Because this trailer... Now, remember, I'm just basing this off of the trailer. And, well, the IMDb page, which has the wonderful synopsis for the movie, based on the graphic novels by Mike Magnola, Hellboy, caught between the worlds of the supernatural and human, battles an ancient sorceress bent on revenge. Well, we now know that that ancient sorceress is going to be played by Mila Jovovich, and she's playing Nimue, the Blood Queen. More on that in a minute. The tagline really gets me, though. Demons have demons, too. Because if there's anything that this trailer tried to get over on us, it's, come on, it's Hellboy. He's just, he's, he's just a guy, you know? A guy. He just happens to look like a demon, but he's a, just a guy. And that's one of the things that I found almost offensive about this trailer. Look, I, I'm not expecting another Guillermo... <laughs> can't even talk today, I'm sorry. Guillermo del Toro film, because, you know, it's not. And he has such a distinct sensibility about him that, you know, that's going to make it look visually different and distinct in a lot of ways. And, yeah, this looks different. And, yeah, it's, you know, kind of awkward not hearing... Ron Perlman's voice, because y'all know my obsession with Ron Perlman. But those aren't the things that bothered me. It was the tone of the trailer. Because I'm, I'm hoping this is just a trailer problem and not something that's actually in the movie. And we'll find out from the trailers that come out after this. But it really felt like they were pushing very hard that, like, it's like a superhero movie, but, you know, with a demon dude who's, you know, just a guy. He's a guy like, you know, all the other guys. And, well, you liked Venom and you liked Deadpool and he's kind of a demon guy. And it's bright and shiny like some of the Marvel movies. So, like, yeah, superheroes. Yay. And that's not what I want in a Hellboy movie. Now, I, I get that one of the main functions that this movie has is to establish a Hellboy cinematic universe 
and don't take that in the way that I mean like a DC cinematic universe or a Marvel cinematic universe, but the, you know, the universe, the world of Hellboy that is visually distinct from the one that, you know, Guillermo del Toro gave us and, you know, del Toro's movies, they were dark, they were desaturated, they were oddly beautiful in a grotesque sort of way. You know, all the things that you come to expect from a Guillermo del Toro film. This movie seemed to have had a checklist of everything. Like, based on this trailer, it feels like this movie had a checklist of everything that Guillermo del Toro did. And they very pointedly decided to do the opposite. Oh, so he was doing a lot of dark, desaturated shots. So we're going to do very bright, overly saturated shots. Well, is that really the best choice for a Hellboy movie? You know, he did a lot of dark humor and almost, you know, sarcastic wit. So our Hellboy, he's going to be grumpy and kind of mean and it's different okay it's just different and what i'm hoping more than anything is that the changes that they made are not just difference for different sake because that's all i really got out of the trailer is look how different our hellboy is yeah your hellboy is different I'll give that to you. But again, as I've said a thousand times, difference does not mean better. And I think a lot of this is the fault with the fact that, you know, directors are still having, uh, in studios, are still having a hard time trying to figure out what to do with these, you know, HD, Ultra HD cameras that they're filming with. And how to use those in the way that the old film cameras were used to create a lot of that sense of difference and distinction. Which is one of the reasons why a lot of these movies are starting to look the same. Because they're not the techniques necessary for this kind of ultra HD filmmaking don't really exist at the level that the older, you know, technology that we had for like 80 years to develop those techniques, they're not really there in a way that functions well in this HD, ultra HD world. And that's leading to this strange homogenization of just movies where they all kind of look the same. You know, it's it's getting hard-pressed to look at a film other than, like, Into the Spider-Verse, which came out recently, that has a distinct feel to it. And I think that's kind of a shame. You know, I don't know exactly, you know, why that is. You've heard me kind of put out some of the ideas that I have on that. Because I I do think it's the technology. I think the technology is allowing people to film at such a high definition that they don't yet know what to do. They don't yet know exactly how to make it look like something fresh and original and different and amazing. And maybe that's just me. But, you know, I'm looking at the the director who um, I have only seen some of the TV work that he's done. He did a couple episodes of Black Sails. He did the episodes Blackwater and Watchers on the Wall for... Um, Game of Thrones, Blackwater is a great episode. 
Um, he directed a couple episodes for the Constantine TV series, Non Est Asylum, and Rage of Caliban. He directed an episode of Hannibal, Timeless, Westworld, a couple episodes of Lost in Space that were good. But I, I don't see, you know, anything... I hate to use this term, but, you know, that stands out as something that makes me go, oh, yeah, he has a unique vision for storytelling, for, you know, putting together an image, you know, an image there. Uh, as far as the screen screenwriter, the only things that they've written for before was the TV series Haunted, and he was the creator of Eureka. He's produced a lot of things, but, you know, I don't see much there for the writing either. And that's a little bit upsetting, and I think that's what's feeding into the fact that this doesn't feel distinct. The fact that a TV writer wrote the screenplay and a TV director you know, made the movie. I was watching Council of Geek today and listening to his commentary on the trailer, and he pointed out that it felt like a TV spot more than like a first movie trailer. And I think he's right about that. You know, it did feel a lot more like, you know, this, you know, this weekend on Legends of Tomorrow. Or, you know, like something you would see between, you know, acts on a TV show. And I wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that the creative team behind it, the writer and the director, have that TV background. Is that something that I hadn't really thought about until, you know, he said that. And I'm glad that he did because it gave words to one of the things that bothered me about the trailer. I don't, I don't know. This feels like a, a, a strange departure from what we've been getting as far as, you know, superhero action films go, because let's face it, it's based on a comic book and that's how the people in Hollywood are seeing it. They're looking at it as a superhero action film. And for something with the dark nature that Hellboy should have, and considering that the villain is Nimue, the Blood Queen, I, I would expect a much darker tone to the trailer that just isn't there. You know, I'm not saying that it can't be light, I'm not saying that it can't be funny, I'm not saying that it can't have any of those aspects to it, but, you know, the trailer that we got had a lot of su sunlight and a lot of bright, overly saturated colors in it. That, you know, the comic book didn't even have a lot of bright, unsaturated colors in it. So I, I'm not sure if the movie even has its own visual aesthetic. And it wasn't just that they had a script, they had actors, and they filmed it. And it, I know a lot of my concerns are because of Venom. But it's really making me feel like this is going to be a film in that vein. That it's going to be like another Venom where they had a character, they had some actors, everybody shows up, everybody gets a paycheck, everybody goes home. Because, I mean, David Harbour, who you might know as the uh, sheriff from Stranger Things... He's playing Hellboy. And while it looks like he is having fun with the part, I don't know if it's because he's not used to having to act through all of the, you know, silicone on his face, or if they just did a bit bad job, you know, creating the silicone on his face, but I don't see much emotion coming through. I don't see much characterization coming through. He looks almost like an action figure with a wiggly mouth. And that could be a problem, problem going forward. 
But we'll talk about that more after the break. And we're back. So yeah, before we went to break, I was talking about how I felt that this movie looked and felt like virtually every other movie. And yeah, I, I, I just, I find this problematic. And it's something that I noticed for the first time, actually, when we went to see Deadpool 2. The thing about the first Deadpool movie is it felt like a Deadpool movie. It felt like itself. It didn't feel like it was really aping off of a lot of other, you know, things that had come before it. Or when it did, it felt like it made those filmic techniques its own. And it really felt like it was making a statement as to who it was and what it was doing as a film. When I went to see Deadpool 2, in so many ways, it felt like any other superhero movie with Deadpool in it. And I wasn't, you know, I've made no bones about it, I really didn't enjoy the second Deadpool film. Because I felt that, you know, it was the most standard of standard sequels. It recycled most of the jokes from the first movie, and... You know, I didn't find them as funny the second time around. The only thing that made it worth watching was Domino. Domino was brilliant and deserves her own film free from the baggage that hopefully Deadpool will not become. But visually, it looked and felt like any other movie of its kind. And it lost any sense of being its own thing. And that really did upset me, because what excited me about Deadpool was it found a way to be distinct. You know, in the glut of superhero movies that are out there, it's wonderful when a film finds a way to be itself. You know, Captain America Winter Soldier did a great job at this, Thor Ragnarok did a wonderful job at this and of course the guardians of the galaxy movies they are what they are like they're movies that look and feel like themselves this is one of the things that i admire most about the scott pilgrim versus the world which i still to this day say is an underrated movie nothing else quite looks like scott pilgrim versus the world it is its own thing and while, yes, it may be too much to ask that every movie find its own unique look and feel, it, especially for a movie that's going to be set in such a dark universe where there are demons and monsters and devils, I don't think it's too much to ask that it look like a movie where there can be demons, devils, and monsters. And... Yeah, I, I don't mean that it has to necessarily give in to the, all of the tropes about that. Like, it doesn't have to be crazy desaturated to the fact to the point where everything looks either green or blue or anything like that. But the it it shouldn't look like a made for TV movie. And I really feel like this trailer presents it as a made for TV movie. And I know I okay so I'm very conscious of this thing because it's something that I obsess about in my own work you know my fiction is highly idiosyncratic and I don't think that that's a bad thing you know the fact that you know there's you know grotesqueness and beauty and strangeness and everything that I write it makes up in aggregate me it, it's part of my voice it's part of my style and it's something that I really like to play with I I am after all a goth at heart so of course it's going to be dark and hopefully a little beautiful that that's kind of my intent with my own fiction and if I'm able to pull that off, then yay, I'm very excited about that because that's a big part of what it is I'm wanting to do. 
And, you know, you can see that in the cover art that I try to do for the books. I try to make them really stand out for what they are. And maybe it's a blind spot in me that comes about because I am so obsessed about doing this in my own work that makes me desirous of seeing it in the work of others. And maybe that's something that I need to fix about myself. But, you know, with so many movies coming out and with so many TV shows out there and so many shows that are frankly amazing and take up so much of my time, right? You have to find a way to stand out. You know, I, I think we're, at least I know I, am kind of beyond the point of I'm going to consume everything in this particular genre or this particular field just because there's so much of it out there now. I mean, with very few exceptions, such as queer content, which I don't think there's enough of out there at all, and it's one of the reasons why I spend so much time working on it, because it's something that I want to see and I don't see, with the exception of coming out stories and coming out stories and dealing with coming out stories and... Did I mention coming out stories? Like, there seem to be a lot of coming out stories. And I'm done with it. And, but, you know, I think that you have to show that you have something special to g garner my attention. I mean, this is what The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina did so well, right? They showed me Sabrina, and the actress that they picked reminded me a lot of the original, you know, Sabrina TV series that was out when I was younger. But it looked dark, and it looked creepy, and it, it looked fun. And so it earned time. I, I watched it. I loved it. I've rewatched it. It's kind of becoming an obsession for me. And we're actually going to be talking about it a bit more when we get to the best of 2018 stuff later this month. But it earned that place because it showed me that it was different. The same thing with like the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is something that I have loved since season one. It earned a spot with me because it went, look at me, I'm different, I'm quirky, and here's how. Is this something you're interested in? And from the first trailer, I was hooked. I wanted to see it. I wanted to see more. And, you know, it's one of the few Amazon Prime shows I watched the day it came out. Because I was that excited about it. And I know it's unfair. And I really know it's unfair because as a content creator, you know, I feel that same pressure with my own fiction of trying to figure out exactly how to create that interest, you know, with my own work. But there you go. You know, I am trying to figure it out for my own stuff because there's just so much out there. I think you have to find a way to be different. I think you have to find a way to be unique. I think idiosyncratic is the way of the future. I th that's why something like The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina works for me. Because it's so strange and it's so bizarre that it's not... While it reminds me of other shows of its type, it's doing things that I don't expect with it. And hopefully it doesn't become predictable and get into a rut. Especially with the Christmas special. The Christmas special was amazing and I really enjoyed it. And the same thing with the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Like every time I think I feel like I know where the series is going, something happens that makes total sense with the characters, very important, and with the setting in the world, that throws me for a loop and takes me in a different way. And that idiosyncratic nature is what makes for compelling entertainment now. I really do believe that. And that's, 
you know, what has worried me about, you know, the Aquaman movie that just came out or that is about to come out. Yeah, it's out now. You know, I love Jason Momoa. I've had drinks with him at a bar once and I love his laugh and he's such a good guy and I've enjoyed a lot of stuff with him in it. But it looks, it's a superhero movie and I'll rent it when it comes out because I don't feel like going to the Pain Palace to watch it. And, you know, for the first time for a Harry Potter movie since I got into Harry Potter, I felt the same way about The Crimes of Grindelwald. It looked interesting, but not enough to go to the Pain Palace. You know, I'll watch it as soon as it comes out on digital. You know, we'll probably buy it day one, but eh, you have to be special. That's the one thing that all of the movie studios need to bear in mind. It's one of the brilliant things that Marvel has done with the cinematic universe by picking these directors that each have their own kind of twist on how they make a movie and why they messed up when they fired James Gunn, but we're not getting into that again right now. It allowed the movies to be distinct even when they all take place in the same cinematic universe, they often have the same characters as other movies, but yet they're different. The look and feel of an Iron Man movie is so different from the look and feel of a Captain America movie. And then even more so for like a Doctor Strange, which lived up to its word, <laughs> its name, it's strange. Or Ant-Man, which is a wonderful set of you know heist movies and i i just you have to adore that that they allowed those movies to be what they wanted to be and be in the genre that they naturally desired to be in that's where all of my concern comes in for this hellboy reboot it's not so much that they're doing a reboot reboots happen I'm used to that but it didn't give me a reason to care. It just went, hey, look, here's our Hellboy. Here's some of our other cast. Look how bright and overly saturated, oversaturated it is. Superhero movie, yay. And at least for me, that's not enough to get me excited about your film anymore. It was something that worked when this genre was rare, but it's no longer rare. So you have to do something to stand out, and hopefully the next trailer will be better. But, considering I just did all of that talk yesterday on, you know, just do, meeting the bare minimum, which I thought Venom did, like the barest bones minimum for a superhero flick, I feel like I'm seeing the signs of that already with this Hellboy, and this is a series that should be better than that. And hopefully the next trailer will make me go, okay, I was wrong. But right now, eh. if you like this episode, please, if you're capable in the app that you're listening to me on, rate either the series or the episode itself, or both. That helps a lot. That tells the algorithm that they should share me with other people. If you want to support everything that I'm doing, please either click the support button or if there's not one in the app that you're listening to me on in the show notes there'll be a link that says support on anchor you can support me at the one dollar five dollar ten dollar a month levels that really does help me out a lot and help me keep these podcasts coming as you can see i push through even when my head is trying to destroy me like it has been this week because i love you all and your support means the world to me um if you don't have the money to give, I completely understand that. I am about to plunk down a whole bunch of money on Vellum. Thank you to all of my supporters who made that possible. So that when I do the next set of ebooks that are coming out and the next set of print books that come out, they'll look better and be really good and nice for you guys. And I couldn't have done that without you. As you probably heard on the last couple episodes, my mic is starting to do weird things, which makes me worry that I'm going to have to buy a new mic soon. Mics are not cheap. If you can help, please do. If you can't, 
please share this podcast with people that you think will like it. As you can see, we now have ad support on this show. And so the more people that hear it, the more money the podcast makes, and the easier it will be for me to replace equipment when I need to do that. And it's looking like I'll need to do that sooner rather than later. So please share. That, that helps me out a lot. If you want to connect with me, Twitter's the best place. I'm C.E. Dorset on Twitter. Um, you can find a link to every, all my social media and everything that I do over at ProjectShadow.com. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now. Until later, don't forget, have the fun. Bye.